Okay. All right. Yeah, so it's terrible. I just wanted to make a slight illustration because in talking about Montesquieu, it's important to understand the context that Montesquieu is writing, specifically the situation in France. And so I'm going to talk a tiny little bit about absolutism and what made the French monarchy differ from its fellows. So over here, in sort of the area that would become like Germany, Poland, okay, these areas had the highly decentralized uh, system where you had the emperor, Holy Roman Empire, where you had very weak, weak king. He was an emperor, but very weak king. The nobles were extremely powerful. On their actual estates, though, they could behave as virtually an autocrat. There was still serfdom there. They were the literal lords of their little uh, fiefs. Remember, there were about 300 of them, right? So this right here was only nominally conjoined. It was very, very uh, bifurcated, very broken up. The Holy Roman Empire, very weak king, powerful noble, right? And they supported the king. Uh, because uh, the, king, the king could not really do anything to them, and, and uh, so there was just a nice mutual relationship there. He's not a powerful king at all. Then, in uh, the low countries here, we had republicanism, the Dutch Republic. Right? Now I need to explain, they didn't have a king, right? Okay, and then across the channel here, in jolly old England, we had Parliamentary monarchy. Which again, very weak king. Right? Very weak king. So even though the king retained the power, for example, to like declare war or something like that, or conduct foreign policy, if you aren't on the same page with parliament and you get yourself into a pickle, get yourself into a war and parliament won't give you money, you're going to be a heck of a problem here. In fact, that's what happened to uh, Charles, the one who gets his head chopped off. He doesn't want to call Parliament, he's going to rule without Parliament, but he accidentally provokes a fight uh, with the Scots, and he has to call Parliament back, and this kickstarts uh, the English Civil War. In Spain, I don't really know what to say about Spain here, it's not going to be terribly central. Basically in Spain, we talk about how the discovery of silver in the New World, we had all of this new silver flowing in from South America, it enabled the monarchy for a period of time, essentially during the 1500s, to fuel a massive military and global imperialist expansion, okay? But the thing about Spain, uh, has anyone ever been to Spain? Or looked at like a topographical map? Okay, it's even more mountainous and divided than Italy is. Very, very hard for a central monarch here to go impose the kind of force that you need to impose on your nobility. Uh, so it's, it's going to be a very uh, nominally strong, a nominally strong king here. Uh, this is Spain. It's going to be nominally strong, but very weak in actual point of practice. If I demand that you pay me some, some tribute, you know, some tax money, and you say no, well, I guess that's just, I guess you're just not gonna pay me then, fine. <laughs> There's just not really a lot I can do about that. Um, Spain is going to be sort of the sick man of Europe for a very, very long time. And uh, they were very blessed to have a lovely mountain range right here called the Pyrenees that kept them largely uh, isolated from what's going on over there. And so Italy, we've already talked about Italy here. We have all the competing republics. Lots of competing republics. Everything from Pisa to Genoa. Although Pisa by this time has been absorbed by Florence, Milan, Venice, and then down here in the boot, this beautiful illustration of Italy here. This is Sicily. You have the Kingdom of Naples, which was um, not terribly powerful because it's very resource poor down there. And that leaves us with France. France is a wonderfully flat, wonderfully flat country, except in the south here where there are, there are mountains, the Alps are down here, but it's, it's generally very flat. And in France, what we have developed is absolute monarchy. Abs 
absolutism. Okay, so in medieval monarchy, which is basically what the Holy Roman Empire continues to be, is you have a very weak king who rules together with the nobility. The king is highly constrained by custom, by law, by honoring the, the feudal rights of the nobility. Under absolutism, the king is above the law. The king rules alone, essentially. It's highly centralized. So what happened, and we've already talked about this a little bit, is King Henry, and then under King Louis XIII and King Louis XIV, what happened was there was a marginalization of the nobles. And as they started to build up a state apparatus, they started to build a military bureaucratic state that was professionally staffed. Instead of letting you run the port in Marseille because you're my cousin's nephew and duke of whatever, duke of Anjou, although he'd be much more important than port collectors, but whatever, um, you hire someone who is uh, has experience in uh, in tax collecting, who's uh, in commerce, for example. We have the rise of commerce, the rise of uh, Protestantism, of mass literacy. Um, so you you have professional staffing, professionals, and importantly, they're middle class professionals because nobles have a power base that is independent from the king. They have their own. Uh, tenants, they have their own vassals. The thing about a nice middle class bureaucrat is they owe their position entirely to you, the king. So they're going to be entirely loyal to you. And so this is critical. Um, Richelieu, uh, if you've read The Three Musketeers or you've watched any of the movies, remember the, the kind of evil guy in the first Three Musketeers, Cardinal Richelieu? He's the first minister of Louis the Thirteenth, and he's the one who essentially pioneers a lot of this, a lot of these practices, taking the nobles out of important positions, putting middle class merchants and other functionaries in their place, um, centralizing uh, control. There's a revolt that happens; it's called the Fronde, and uh, that's put down militarily. Um, he attacks the uh, the Huguenots, the French Protestants, to uh, disarm them, essentially, uh, and. Uh, to make a unitary state. So um, the French state is going to be absolute. And so this is all taking place in the mid 1600s. Montesquieu is writing in the mid 1700s. So he's had a chance now, highly educated man, well studied, he's had a chance to see what happened during this period of 100 years of increasingly absolutist centralized rule where the king could essentially do whatever he wanted. And he came to the conclusion that things were not going well for France, or as well as they could be going, for these very reasons. You have to understand, France, despite being the overwhelmingly most powerful state on the continent, did very little but lose wars to uh, England and its allies. Uh, lost virtually every war that they fight. Um, king Louis XIV, the Sun King, the Great Sun King, ends his reign, we talked about, with a series of military defeats. The War of the Spanish Succession, later the War of the Austrian Succession. These are extremely expensive wars and they're losing all of them. Um, one thing about uh, the finances of, of France, and this is gonna be important, so we're going to talk about the French Revolution here in two weeks, three weeks, I'm sorry, three weeks. There were three estates, three estates, okay? There was the nobility, and you couldn't tax them. That's part of the deal. Look, I'll leave your wealth alone, but you're going to be politically quiescent. I won't touch your wealth, but you're going to do what I say politically and not cause any problems. Good deal? Okay. The church. Also could not be taxed. France was the great protector of, of Catholicism. The church could not be taxed. That left the third estate, which for a long time meant the peasants who could be squeezed mercilessly. But increasingly, France isn't just a peasant society. 
We've had the rise of commerce going on in the 1600s and the 1700s related to the expansion of trade. And so you have the rise of a very, very wealthy upper level, we become the upper class lawyers, merchants, bankers, who are exceedingly wealthy, who are providing the lion's share of the revenue, right? Peasants are not, they're numerous, but they're not wealthy, never have been. And these are the people, the upper middle class, the merchant, banking, legal, I guess I should just say professional, professional class. These are the ones who are going to make the first revolution. These are the people who are representing the third estate. These are the people who are gonna walk out and say, if we don't get fair representation, uh, we are not going to participate anymore. So it's important to understand that the king, by ruling by himself, is able to mercilessly squeeze this sector of society in order to finance uh, increasingly dubious policies that did not work, and uh, people are just not willing to take things that don't work. The English uh, working class was willing to pay a great deal to uphold the British Empire, especially when it was reaching its zenith in the late 1800s, early 1900s. The British working class was paying an incredible amount for this and were much poorer than they would have been. And they were willing to do this, however, because British policy was largely successful. Britain controlled you know, the largest empire ever. Um, but when your policy is producing nothing but lost wars and failures and debt, that's not gonna be the case. And it prompts intellectuals to think about why France is not running the way that it should be. And what Montesquieu hits on is he says, look, in the look history, the most successful kinds of government are the kind that balance power between various interest groups. Because if, if one part of the government, say the king, has a bad idea, if King Charles the second or whatever has a bad idea in foreign policy, let's go fight this war, Parliament is gonna be able to come in and say, no, 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 we're not gonna pay for that, right? Or if Parliament is trying to ram through, uh, the House of Commons is trying to ram through some uh, series of laws that are going to be bad country, you can have the House of Lords veto them. And the House of Lords was kind of acting as uh, almost like a court, right? They would review things. Um, there were other courts, of course. But. So what I want to spend a little bit of time talking about here in the beginning is uh, Montesquieu's specific ideas about checks and balances to give you some examples, some concrete examples, so we can kind of see how this works in practice besides the American system, which I think that you're all quite familiar with. And then we'll look at some types of governments that don't have uh, any kind of serious checks or balances. So, <clears throat> okay, so, yes, okay. So, remember, Montesquieu, is one of the Enlightenment thinkers. So he is interested in protecting uh, individual rights. He is interested in protecting property. And he is interested in creating a better society. That's something to, to keep in mind, right? Uh, we associate progressivism today, right, with trying to create a better society. These were like the proto-progressives. Remember, they are interested in applying reason and logic and examples in order to build better societies because these will create uh, better people. So he's trying to prevent the concentration of power and promote accountability in order to protect individual liberty. You can't have arbitrary government. You can't have a government that does not respect uh, restraints on itself uh, with uh, a system of checks and balances, at least theoretically. So there have been many examples throughout history where there were no clear checks and balances. Ancient Egypt is a good one where you had the Pharaoh as the God King right? Uh, the Persian Empire, the one that uh, attempts to conquer uh, Greece uh, during the Spartan Wars, the Achaemenid uh, Persian Empire. Um, uh, yes, here's a good one. Uh, Le tesse moi. This was Louis XIV's famous phrase. It means I am the state. So to an absolute monarch like Louis the, Louis the XIV, the idea that there were some other interests that the state had that existed outside of his own personal interests. He represented, at least to himself and to those who uh, believed in absolutism, that this was the state, that the king's person represented the state. And there were reasons that, that, that absolutism had um, its defenders. Absolutism seemed to create very strong state. And you have to remember, 
Europe is defined by war. And if you look next door at the Holy Roman Empire, for example, and you're sitting there in France and you think, boy, or you're sitting there in Italy and you're thinking, boy, gosh, we're getting preyed upon by everyone and their brother, right? Um, think about it. Uh, the German states essentially become a playground for uh, more powerful powers. The Russians, oh yes, I didn't put the Russians up here. The Russians, we don't really talk about them much. They're a strict autocracy. So even beyond absolutism in, in France, uh, the czar's word is just, is just law. Um, he need not ask anything. He controls his nobles. He taxes them as he wishes. He is the head of the church, um, uh, the Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, so that's a, that's a different example. The textbook really doesn't give any examples uh, of, of, of Russia. So actually, that was the next one that I had on here. Uh, Russia. Uh, Russia was one where it's literally just an autocratic ruler. Uh, controlled the executive, legislative. Um, they create, you know, like secret police. That was not something that was created by Joseph Stalin. That, that was a, that was a, a long-established institution within the, the Russian Empire, going back many centuries. Um, the Ottoman Empire is, is one that, that, that mostly works. Um, remember, we talked about the Ottomans. They were the ones who overran Constantinople, prompting the Europeans to start looking for other trade routes. Um, they, they were uh, theoretically um, all powerful, uh, but this was largely uh, based on their ability to militarily uh, subordinate um, uh, local governors. And, and as central authority weakened, much in the same way we saw the Roman Empire fragment, the same thing is going to happen uh, to the Ottoman Empire as well. So, um, present day examples. Can anyone think of a present day example of a country that is ruled without checks and balances? There aren't, there aren't uh, many who maybe stand out to you. I know there are many, many countries, but many of them are very small and obscure. Isn't Turkmenistan like a... Turkmenistan, that'd be a good one. Strict autocracy. That'd be a good one, yeah. There was one that I was sure someone would say. North Korea? North Korea, okay, yeah, North Korea. Okay. But isn't it technically, I know that there's like, they do like a big, that's technically the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, right? Mm -hmm. But it's like Kim Jong Un's the only person on the ballot. Yeah, wins. You know, like Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein used to have elections. You know, he'd win ninety nine point nine percent of the vote. Or like, you know, he's just very stuff. popular. Yeah, just very popular guy. So, okay. <clears throat> one one of the problems with with autocratic government or government without checks and balances is it makes property intensely insecure. Right, you have no one to appeal to. Property can just be expropriated from you. This is something that happens in France. Uh, the Protestant uh, population of the South here, the Huguenot French population. I mentioned uh, the Edict of Nantes. Edict of Nantes. This was meant to end religious war in France by granting freedom of religion. Remember the Edict of Toleration that John Locke recommended, his letter on toleration said, look, it's not wise for the government to concern itself with matters of conscience. All religion should be tolerated. Well, one of the French kings, it was one of the Henrys, one of Henry III, I think, perhaps, he issues this edict of not where he says, look, we're not going to kill each other over who's Protestant and who's Catholic anymore, which had been a favorite pastime of the French uh, going back for centuries. And as part of the deal, he says, look, and you don't even have to take my word for it, all you Huguenot South Protestant Frenchmen, you may arm yourselves and you may fortify your towns in case anyone ever tries to attack you. Okay? Louis XIII comes along and Cardinal Richelieu says, mm, I don't really love that there's this like little state within a state here. You know, they've got their own military. Don't really like this. Not good for, we can't really be an absolutist government if they're existing. So he very slowly wages war on the individual Protestant towns, conquers them, disarms them, tears down their walls and says, but can still have your religion, you know, just don't want you to be armed up just in case. And what happens about 40 years later, Louis XIV revokes the Edict of Nantes, comes after the Protestants, who have now been helpfully disarmed, and many of them leave the country. Huge brain drain, huge wealth drain, because you're not going to stay in a country where your, your, your property is not protected, and it couldn't be protected. It was at the whim of a single ruler. This is something that we, that we see today, where uh, countries that have very strong uh, property rights are going to be more successful than countries that don't uh, because people are more willing to invest their money there, to work hard there. 
how hard are you willing to work if you don't know whether or not the government can't just come and expropriate everything that you've worked for with no recourse? Um, so uh, countries that did have uh, systems that did have strong checks and balances. Um, we saw that the, the, the Roman Republic had that very elaborate system of checks and balances. And of course, he's an Enlightenment figure, so he's very interested in reading the classics. We remember in the Roman system, you had the tribunate, which represented the people. That is like the mass of people, right? Then you had the Senate, which represented uh, basically the patrician class, the wealthy, nobility. And at the top you had the uh, consuls, the executive. And you had two of them, number one and number two. And they could block and check each other. And the, the, the system balanced balance itself out very nicely. So that's a favorite example that he uses there. Um, let's see. Uh, who can think of a good, okay, besides the United States, besides the United States, who can think of a country today that has a system of checks and balances? Yeah. Well, I mean, like, I know that there's UK Parliament and then mm -hmm. there's the um, Call of House of Lords, right? Yep. Yep. And they have, uh, you know, the, the prime ministership and they have uh, the courts. So, yes, rule of law is very strong. Checks and balances. Would you also, well, I don't know if it would be connected with the same thing as the balance, but all the people that are in like their equivalent of like their bureaucracy are people that are already part of parliament too, right? That they're, sorry, say it more. That all the members of their bureaucracy, like their cabinet, like in British government, are just people that are members of the parliament, whereas you're yes. independently appointed. Yes, very interesting. Um, this is just a note on comparative government here. The way parliamentary government works is if you, uh, they have an election, right? And let's just keep it simple and say that there's two parties. Right. If your party wins uh, the election, gets the majority of the seats, you then put together your government from your membership in the House. Right. So if you are the leader of the blue party, we're just calling the blue and the red party. If the blue party won the election, you don't have like a president or something. They just voted for the blue party. And so now you, as the leader of the blue party, you become prime minister. And now you pick out associates from your blue party uh, to staff the cabinet. Now, if you're really smart and you're trying to create like a good solid majority, maybe you have a very slim majority, maybe you pick a couple people from the red party and you say, look, I'll let you into the cabinet, but you have to support the government now. Because if you lose a vote, uh, they can call basically a vote. And if you don't win the vote, then you know the government dissolves, they call it collapsing, the government falls. My wife hates that. I'm like, oh yeah, the government of her. She's like, what? What happened? I was like, oh, they just lost someone. She's like, come on. Just sounds too dramatic. Like the government fell. No, it just means they lost the vote. Yeah. Are, are you talking about coalitions or voting blocks? Yes. I mean, there there are multiple parties, and what you want to do, it's very hard to win an outright majority in many of these European countries, like in Germany, which is another really good example of a country that has checks and balances. Also, it's very competitive multi-party elections. It's very hard to win an outright majority. And so what you have to do is you have to make coalitions with other parties. And then when you win the election, you have to give other members of the parties seats on the cabinet, right? P parts the, to play in the government. Like for example, um, in Germany right now, uh, right now uh, the foreign minister, Baerbach, she's not a member of, of Olaf Scholz's party. She's a member of the Green Party, but they are coalition allies. And so you, you have to reward them with portfolios, otherwise they won't support your government. Something very uh, close to that just happened in France, because what happened in France, the French center party, Emmanuel Macron's party, had to reach out to the, had to reach out to the leftist parties, the liberal communists and socialists, to defeat the right-wing parties, specifically the National Front of Marine Le Pen. After they won the election, though, Emmanuel Macron said, nah, I don't actually want any of you in the government because you're gross and I want to cut social spending and I, I just can't have you guys in the government. You guys are, you know, commies and socialists. I'm not going to put you in the government. And so it was very close whether or not they were going to abandon the government and we were going to have another round of elections, which the right almost certainly would have won. Emmanuel Macron calculated that they would not abandon the government because his government was better than the government they would get under Le Pen. And he wanted to be incorrect about that, but it was a very dicey gambit. Um, in Germany, you have the, the Bundestag and the Bundesrat. Germany's system is highly federalized, very interesting. You've got a lower house and upper house, just like us. We've got uh, you know, a, a 
constitution, uh, basically a, the federal constitutional court, which is like a Supreme Court. Uh, and of course, you have you know, your prime minister and presidents. So it's, it's all very interesting, very good stuff. Um, if you look at countries that have um, uh, strong rule of law and divided power in government, uh, and you try and correlate for things like economic growth, you're going to find that these governments grow their economies much, much, much faster, especially if you remove China from the equation. China, uh, China's economic growth over the last 20 years has really thrown that off, it, but it's an outlier. Is North Korea famed for its economic growth? No, how about Venezuela, Iran, any of these countries? No, right, not, not even close. Um, Russia was the great backwards country of Europe, right? When they go to World War I, they can't even produce enough rifles and you know a million other things, terribly backwards. So, um, yeah. Would you say another type of check and balance, because you mentioned France, right? And mm -hmm. isn't the, the difference in France, like they have a president and a prime minister? They do. Then, yep. Would that be the difference between who's the head of state versus who's the head of government? Um, yes, and it, it depends on, on a case-by-case -case basis. I'm not 100% sure what the specific role of the president in the French system is, um, whether or not they like head the Senate, because um, the prime minister has the actual responsibility of running the government. Uh, as is the case in the UK and in pretty much every other case that I'm aware of in Europe, it's mostly prime ministers. And then in South America, it's mostly presidents. So, Because the difference with like a prime minister typically is that there is a parliament, right? Yeah, or some kind Cause of that's why, Because the US House is based off of, off of parliament the same way that like whoever's the prime minister of X country is based off of who the members are like, and then that's why we have like a speaker in the house, right? Yes that, is, yes, that is true, but of course we have a presidential system. So mm -hmm. we have the executive independent from uh, the actual house, whereas in England it is basically the house who then becomes the executor of government mm -hmm. coming directly out of the house. So take comparative government in the uh, spring with me. We'll talk a ton about that stuff. I actually just got a request from the bookstore the other day asked me what textbook we should use. So I'm going to take a look at that this weekend. So, did anyone have any specific passages of Montesquieu that they enjoyed? Did you enjoy Montesquieu? No. Well, he's French. He's French. I also don't like French. Sorry, that was recorded. Uh, Vive la France! I don't know. Just kidding. No. Uh, yeah. Uh, he was it. Was it? Was it readable though? Yeah. That's my primary concern because, of course, some of these tracks can be very, very dense. And so my concern is, could you understand him? Mm. You could. Straightforward enough? Yes? Okay. Um, okay. So uh, yes, all I had really wanted you to read there, because he goes, he goes on at great length about a lot of things we've already talked about. And so the interesting part, of course, is uh, Book 11, Laws that Comprise Political Liberty, Their Relation to the Constitution. And specifically, he's interested in Chapter 6, the English Constitution, because he sees that as, remember, Who's been defeating France in all of these wars? Just think, just think about it. You're sitting there, and you're Montesquieu, and you're France. You dominate the best part of Europe. You're massive. You've got this huge land army. You're super rich. Your monarch is all powerful. He's built this huge palace, the biggest building and complex that anyone's ever seen in Europe in you know a thousand years since the Roman Empire. And you're being defeated nonstop by this tiny little island. What's going on here? It really does make one question, doesn't it? Wouldn't it make you question? Well, it certainly makes Montesquieu question. He views the English system as entirely superior. Entirely superior. Because it balances the interests of all the different uh, parts of the population, and it allows for bad ideas by one part of the government to be vetoed by other parts of the government, right? So uh, he's going to be uh, very much uh, of one of those, he, he's dead by that point, but he would very much have been sympathetic to those liberals, small l liberals, who in 1789 attempt to uh, institute essentially a, uh, a parliamentary monarchy um, in uh, France. They were not interested in killing the king and ushering in um, some kind of radical democratic republic. That is ultimately what happens because the political revolution turns into a social revolution and you know, war explodes all over the continent, spoiler alert. Um, but what they were hoping to do, they didn't, want, they didn't want to kill the king, they just wanted the king to accept essentially the system of government that had already been established 
in England and which was producing such phenomenal results. Yes. Would you say the term constitutional monarchy is the same as parliamentary monarchy in this case? Yes, yes. I'll just say constitutional monarchy. Is everyone familiar with constitutional monarchy? Yeah. It means the monarch is essentially put in a box, right? Do, 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 right? Instead of over here, the absolute monarchy, which has the king. Let's see if I can draw a crown. There we go. Crown outside the box, over the box, above the law. No one can tell the king what to do, not really. Um, it's one of the reasons that uh, King Charles, right? King Charles, he refuses when Parliament finally captures him. I can't remember which battle they ca they capture him after one of those battles in the English Civil War, and they don't they don't want to kill him. But eventually, they are pretty much he pretty much forces them to kill him because he's so uncooperative. He won't make any uh, concessions to Parliament. He won't uh, allow for any impingement on his prerogative because he views his prerogative as having come from God and that they're all violating uh, the, the divinely sanctioned order, and he is not willing to even enter a plea. He is not even willing to recognize the authority or legitimacy of parliament to try him as king. It's just not possible to try him as a king. So Charles was the wannabe uh, absolute monarch, and he gets his head chopped off for his troubles. So, peace. We all love peace, right? We all love peace. Uh, okay, so the other reading that we had was Kant's uh, Prescription for Perpetual Peace. It's written in 1795. So just as the French Revolutionary Wars are getting underway, Kant is a uh, German. Uh, those wars are not going to go terribly well for the Germans. Remember, you have, I'm going to erase this here. Remember, the uh, German quote-unquote states, the Holy Roman Empire, is divided among 300 princes, all of whom have their own little professional revenues, all of whom have their own little officer corps, and they are going to run into this buzzsaw of mass... What did you say? I just wanted to get a picture of it. Oh, that's okay. It's right on there. Oh, perfect. Don't worry. It's the reason I record everything. Also for Tobin. Tobin's not here today. Hi, Tobin. All right. So, the French Revolutionary Army is one of the interesting things about the, the French Revolution, and I, you know Napoleon gets credit for being like a military genius, but I think it's questionable just what a genius he was because you see he's facing all of these tiny little individual armies, you know, that are trying to coordinate together, and he just gets to command this massive phalanx of peasant troops that they've armed up, and they just go in full-on human wave attacks. And one of his apocryphal quotes is, uh, well, I think it might be apocryphal. I've seen various interpretations, but quantity has quality all of its own. Because you had all these highly professional, rigorously trained men whose, whose whole life was combat, right? And they were trained in the, the art of war. And the French were just like, I just grabbed like, you know, 50,000 peasants and just charge straight ahead, <laughs> fix bayonets and charge, run them right through. And they do, they slaughter everybody. And uh, so yeah, that's, that's pretty much what's going on there. And it isn't until Napoleon runs into the even bigger block of mass armed uh, Russian army, right? So, and they just have huge, horrible battles. Just absolutely horrible battles. Who was it that told me the new Napoleon movie? Who to watch it, you? Yeah, sorry, me too, yeah. Read a good book on it, it's much better. Anyway, so uh, 1795, we are about to hit a period of Horrifying, horrifying war. And of course, it wasn't as though the preceding century had been all that uh, peaceable. There had been many, many, many wars um, during the 1700s. There had been even, arguably, I think, worse wars in the 1600s, because this is when the wars of religion were going on, the Thirty Years' War. And so, to an Enlightenment figure like Kant, this was simply a technical problem a problem of bad society, of bad government. And that with the right prescriptions, the right reforms, we could eliminate war. This is why I keep coming up, coming back to this idea of progressivism. The Enlightenment people are progressives in the sense that they believe that by using human reason and passing reforms and laws, they can create a better society, right? We talked about Locke and his idea of the tabula rasa, right? The blank slate. 
that human beings can simply be educated to be better. And uh, who's, it, who's it that we're going to read? Who's it that we're going to read? Who says no? There's something made. Yeah, actually, it was Kant, but we didn't read that bit of Kant. Kant actually says no, there are like some deep structures that, that exist and that we kind of build off of those. But um, that isn't going to prevent him from saying that look, we, we can improve, we can eliminate war, uh, perpetual peace. So what is his prescription? What does what does Kant come up with? What does he recommend? He's got a he's got a few moving parts to this, right? What were some of the parts that he had? Us here. What do we need to do? Obviously, it's a massive coordination problem, right? Because we all have different interests. The various states and rulers all have different interests. And where these come into conflict, uh, historically, what happened when you disagreed? You just armed up and you went to war about it. What, what is his prescription? What does Kant recommend? Was Kant penetrable? Was his writing intelligible? I'm just asking because I know his critique of pure reason is not terribly reader-friendly. Did you have trouble with this particular text? Mm. A little bit. A little bit. Okay. Kant is a, not an easy read. So do not be uh, put off by that. Kant is not an easy read at all. So he essentially is advocating a federal... He's, he's advocating a global... Federalism, essentially. So, what is a federal system? Isn't it like kind of what we have in our government with like the big government on top and then the state government and then the local government? Kind of like... That's interesting, it's interesting that you say that because what's very funny is there was a debate between the federalists and the anti-federalists in the American system. Yeah, and the anti-federalist papers and all of that fun stuff. Yes, and yeah. interestingly what happened here, and this is why I think there's some confusion about this in our own case, in the American case specifically, is the federalists were arguing for strong central government. But of course, that's not what an actual federal system was. It was a tremendous propaganda coup by the Federalists. Uh, these people were very leery of strong central government. That's what they had fought the revolution for. They needed to brand themselves as Federalists in order to get the Constitution passed. A federal system is all states are co-equal, right? It's a federal state. They're all joined together by a Constitution, and they're all equal powers, equally shared between them. Yes. Well, just ask about the specific distinction, because I know that there's also, what would be the specific difference between that and the Confederacy? Because the Confederacy also has that same idea mm -hmm. that we just bring a bunch of small governments together, but they're not as bound by like a national system that like a Federalist one would be, right? What you'll see, what you'll see described in, in the American context is marble cake federalism, mm -hmm. where there is a, where there is, in theory at least, a federal central government whose powers interact with the co-equal states and help resolve disputes between them. In the case of the Confederacy, which is what the American states are initially, there is no mechanism for resolving disputes between states. So, and even in the case of the American Confederacy, there really was more of a federal structure to it. And if you look at the Constitution of the Confederate States and you look at how it actually executed its powers, granted, there was a war going on, and so that does tend to distort constitutional arrangements. The Confederacy, in principle, behaved exactly like the Union government behaved in terms of you know, dominating its states, which again, it was wartime, so maybe that's not the best example here, but yeah. So then would you just say that they would, like the national government is given like specifically designated roles of like immigration or like who can be a citizen, for mm -hmm. example, like those are specifically nationally designated roles and then we have the 10th amendment to say that everything else is up to the state, would you say that's an example of it? Yes, very much so, very much so. And that's one of the reasons that uh, a bill of rights being added to the constitution because the bill of rights was not originally attached to the constitution. The constitution looked like it was not going to get passed. 
Um, there, there, there are several great books on it. One written recently by a guy named Klarman, K-L-A-R-M-A-N, if you want to read about it. Um, he goes through uh, all of the, he literally goes from the front. It's a huge book. But it's, if you're interested in American constitutional history, it's actually a really good read. He's a good storyteller. Um, but he goes all the way from uh, the crisis, the crisis period where it's like, the Articles of Confederation are not working terribly well, in the opinion of people like Madison, and we need something different. And it goes through all the different phases, the different conventions, all the way to Philadelphia, and then through to the ratification process and the creation of the Bill of Rights. And the Tenth Amendment was uh, very important because it, it, it reassured those who were afraid of a creeping, powerful central government. They're like, yeah, you say that it's going to be this way, but we all know what happens over time. Power, you know, attracts more power. And, uh, you know, there are great readers of the Greeks. You know, uh, Thucydides, power only ever desires more power. So, the federal system, global federalism, it was all states would be equal. He also, this is a normative, a normative piece of writing. He does not take the states as they are. He does not take it as a, uh, you know, um, you know, monarchies, autocracies. He says there will be all representative republics. And they'll be co-equal. Why representative republics? Again, Republican form of government was seen as progressive. It was seen because only enlightened, educated people who could understand their own self-interest could govern themselves in this way and be willing to submit their disputes to arbitration rather than war. We're going to talk about Adam Smith next week, I believe. And he, he's important because he's writing, I believe in 1776 is when Wealth of Nations comes out. It's a, it's a tremendous text. Remember, economics didn't really exist as a discipline. He's actually a moral philosopher. We retrospectively call him an economist, but if you had said to someone in 1750, I'm an economist, they have no idea what that what, what is that? It's not a thing. Um, mercantilism. Who's heard the word mercantilism? Anyone? Mercantilism. This was the reigning uh, political economic ideology. What this held was that there was a limited amount of wealth in the world, and that the state's policy should be to dominate as much of the trade as you can, to exclude all other states as much as you can, and to hoard all of it into yourself. Adam Smith comes along and says, actually, by working together, I can show you that through free trade, we will all be better off. If we have open markets and open means of exchange, so um, again, only educated people would be willing or able to allow for free trade. Um, mercantilism was a policy that led to war because if you want to get some, uh, well, rubber wasn't really a factor then. If you wanted to get access to some sugar, sugar was a, a hot commodity, and you didn't have uh, a colony with sugar, what did you do to go get some sugar? You had, to go, you had to go wage a war to take a colony where there was sugar from someone else because it was closed trade. Uh, Bastiat, Bastiat is his name. He's a French uh, political theorist of this time, one of the small L classical liberals. He writes around the same time as Montesquieu and Adam Smith that if goods, can, if goods are not free to cross borders, then armies will. So a very succinct way of expressing what Adam Smith believed was the truth. That under a system of mercantilism, it would turn all interaction into essentially economic warfare. You'd put tariffs in place to protect your home market or exclude others. That would lead others to do the same thing. You would block them from getting access to raw materials from your colonies, so they would put up barriers to block you from getting your economy. And it was only a matter of time before this turned into war. And so again, the enlightened policy, according to uh, people like Kant and Smith and the other Enlightenment thinkers, is 
going to be free trade. It makes us all richer, and it prevents war over scarce <coughs> resources. It actually grows the pie. And we actually know that mathematically, you can prove that is quite true, that, tr that trade does make us all richer. And it's little wonder that it was those city-states and those states that were most heavily involved in or exposed to trade that grew the wealthiest the fastest. Think about the examples that we've given from the Italian city-states, such as Venice, Genoa, and Pisa, during the time of the Crusades and Middle Ages, that were the most powerful states, to the Dutch Republic, to England, eventually the United Kingdom, right around this time, going to join the two crowns. These are the states that become the most powerful, that are the most exposed to trade. They become the wealthiest. We talked about all the carry-on effects there, because if you have a lot of trade going on, what else do you need if you're going to conduct trade? You need a shipping industry, you need insurance, you need banking, you need all of the things that will grow commerce, import, export, all that good stuff. So, Kant's uh, way to eliminate war is to create a global federalist system where all the states in the world are representative republics who conduct free trade, and when they have a disagreement among themselves, they submit it to the arbitration of a Congress consisting of all of them. Sort of a proto-United Nations. Yes, minus the Security Council. Would he imagine that it's something like the EU? Or, oh, very much so. Like for Europe. Oh, very much so. And if you look at, um, I actually wrote wrote an article some some years ago about the emergence of the EU, and I actually referenced uh, Kant in that article because it was an idea that had existed for some time, and they recognized. Uh, what, what did they start off with? Does anyone know how, how they started? Was it like iron, coal, and something else? Steel, coal, and steel community. And the idea here was, look. What things do we need to wage war against each other? Well, we need iron to make tanks and planes and guns, and we need coal to fire our factories and stuff. And so they said, okay, we'll jointly operate all of these things together. That way we can all be assured that no one is stockpiling or hoarding any to make war on their neighbors. So yes, the European coal and steel community, which eventually uh, it develops very slowly over time. I'll post a, I'll post a, a, a link on the uh, on the board if anyone wants to read because the first couple of pages is just an explanation of how the European Union evolved. And right now, what's going on is uh, in the European Union, which this this is pertinent. We, we can say a couple of things about the European Union today. The European Union very much, very much uh, in its inception. And uh, of course, it expands, right? The European Council, the the the, uh, uh, the European Community, the EC, it gradually expands uh, from the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, when uh, the European Union itself is created by the Maastricht Treaty in the 1990s. Um, I believe it was 1994. It is very much co-equal states, right? When the EU is first. It's, it's it's a level playing field there. Obviously, larger states like France and Germany are, are nominally more powerful, especially the uh, the Germans because they have the, the Bundesbank, which is it served as the model um, uh, for the ECB, the European Central Bank. But what happened is they attempted Brussels. Brussels is uh, the capital. Brussels attempted to make itself the new Washington D.C. essentially to create a United States of Europe after the American model. And there were a series of attempts at doing this in the early 2000s. Um, what you have to do is just like in the American example, you present a new constitution and you have the member states vote on it. And in the American case, it was very narrow. The constitution barely passed, it passed by a single vote among the states. In the European instance, it was defeated. It goes down to defeat. They tried two times, I believe in 2001 and 2006. And then they gave up after that. And the complaints that the, that the European member states had was they gave up too much, sacrificed too much sovereignty. And this is really the problem, isn't it? This is the problem. Even with today, we have something like global federalism. We have the UN, right? We have the UN. I'm running out of space because I rank too big. We have the UN. We have uh, the Assembly. 
So there's the assembly, which is where all states have a seat and you just do up and down voting. But then you also have the Security Council. Which is where the big powers, such as the United States or Russia or China, can veto anything they don't like. So it's, it's not, the UN is not, is not uh, what Khan had in mind. He did not picture a system where essentially one or two powers who didn't like the ruling could just veto um, whatever they wanted. But the reason that this happened is because of concerns about sovereignty. Americans, just like uh, the, uh, the League of Nations, right? After World War I, Woodrow Wilson wants the Americans to join the League of Nations, and he's defeated because American uh, opponents in Congress had concerns about giving up American sovereignty. And so this Security Council was a way to preserve American sovereignty, to make sure that just because the Assembly of States voted a certain way, that, that does not mean that America has to do what they want if America doesn't want to. And so this is a problem that continues if you're someone who, who imagines a system of like global federalism like that and peaceful arbitration between states, there needs to be a willingness among all states to recognize rulings when they are not in their favor, which no one does, right? In theory, um, the United States, yeah, the UN, it's very legitimate and you know, you need to listen to it, unless it rules against Washington, in which case, yeah, we don't have to listen. Beijing, same thing. You know, we need to cooperate, global order, the UN is very important, the UN rules against Beijing, Beijing just ignores it, right? It's, it's the problem, it's these, the larger states refuse to be bound by rules. And so it's, it's a problem for, for something like global federalism. And of course, someone like Kant would say, it's uh, you know because uh, our society hasn't progressed far enough yet. We're just not wise enough to see yet that all of our interests would be mutually better served by cooperation and arbitration rather than, than war. Um, but that is, that is Kant's uh, solution to uh, uh, the, the ill of global war. Of course, tragically, what's going to happen here is from 1795, until 1815, we're going to get world war. We're going to get world war. We're going to get a series of wars that span the entire globe. Um, these are the Napoleonic Wars. Um, I'm not going to really spend any time talking about it, except in the context of what it does politically to places like the Holy Roman Empire. Um, the Holy Roman Empire is going to be smashed by Napoleon's armies, as I said, and it's going to lead to thinking among German nationalists who say, look, the problem here is all these petty princes and bishops and all these different people who want their own sovereignty. When the German people, the German nation, what they need is a strong, unified Germany who's not going to be pushed around by France. And so it's going to start to kickstart the project of German unification, which will be accomplished by a series of wars that we'll look at several weeks from now when we talk about the rise of nationalism. We will talk about the rise of nationalism, tying it into the French Revolution, because the French Revolution is going to take that idea of the general will. Well, if it's not uh, you know, the king, and if it's not a representative republic, it's just this general will, well, whose will is it? The people's. What people? The people of France, right? And so th this is sort of a, a, sort of a nation-building moment. We'll talk more about uh, nationalism, as I said, in, in coming weeks. So, but that was Montesquieu, checks and balances. You'll definitely see a question on the final exam about that. And also on the final exam, I'll probably ask you a question about, uh, you know, like whose idea, who first put forward, a, you know, a system for, you know, perpetual peace or something like that. And you'll answer Kant, of course. Of course you will. You'll all be well prepared and ready to go. So, um, for discussion board this uh, Friday, I'm just going to tell you now, it's not going to be about the reading. It's going to be about your final paper. I want to know what your topic is. I want you to give me a topic, and I want you to babble a few sentences about why you picked this topic. Even if you don't have the idea fully fleshed out, just tell me, this is the topic I'm going to write about. I don't necessarily, I know you had said utopia. Thomas More's utopia is off the table, already taken, but you're going to say something like, I want to do Thomas More's utopia because I'm interested in blah, 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 blah. You don't know exactly what you're going to say about it yet, but this is what I'm going to write about. Uh, Generally speaking, you have already talked to me that like you don't know exactly what your thesis statement is going to be yet. Fine, fine. Just give me a topic so that I know that now that now we're on a track, a track. And that way, if you say, well, 
If you give me something like, I want to write about kingship, but I don't really know what. Well, that's a very broad topic, and now that we know, though, that that's what you're interested in, now we can really, you know, I'll fire back something on the discussion board about, like, okay, here are several options of ways you could go, theoretically. Just give you an example. Because I don't want this to get away from us, because class ends, like, the, the first week of December, and it's almost the end of October. We also have a break in there for Thanksgiving, so let's pick a topic. Let's just, you're not getting married to this topic. It's like a three-page paper, double-spaced, you know? Could bang that out by accident. Okay, maybe not by accident, but with a little bit of elbow grease and with my help, I'm sure that we will get there. Okay, thank you all so much. I look forward to seeing you on Monday. Bear in mind all of the very cool things that are going around on campus, which I mentioned to you. Although I believe those are all next week, so I'll have a chance to bother you about them again. Good weekend. Yes, you too.